Ooh, Ooh. Jane. Welcome back. I've missed you. How did you get on last week? Did did the guest get a word in edgeways? <laughs> the guest did get a word in edgeways. I did miss you though. I did miss oh, you. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm, I'm so sorry. I was I was learning. I, I had to go away on a little trip, and uh, but I it used it very well because I also got a chance to see some wonderful, wonderful actors. So I was learning a little bit of stagecraft at the same time last week. Oh, that sounds great. That sounds really good. Are you ready for Easter, by the way? Uh, I'm. I have no clue at any holidays. Christmas is the only one I can actually remember. All these other things, because I think we don't have kids. Like all my friends who got kids, they all remember all these holidays. I have no idea. So my team actually had to remind me this week. My team in the Philippines that it was Easter coming up and all the, the stuff was going on. What about you? Have you have you got your uh, your chocolate eggs and all the things that you do for well, Easter? Well, you know, I try not to eat too much chocolate. I've got a wedding coming up, you know, so I don't want to, sort of, you know, have to let outfits out and things. No, but of course, Easter is important because I'm, you know, Italian, Catholic, you know, so it's really, so it's the, it's more important than Christmas, really. But anyway. But, but did, did you give up anything for Lent? That's the important thing. Did you stop it doing no, anything? I'm not very good at giving things up. I haven't got the willpower of our guest. Our guest has great willpower. How's that Absolutely. for a second? Absolutely. Absolutely beautiful. So our guest this week is a leadership speaker, best-selling author, award-winning businesswoman, and advisor to US presidents and their task forces, as well as Fortune 500 executives, on how to be effective at engaging their people and stakeholders. She educates leaders and businesswomen on influencing, impacting, and inspiring others to increase profits, productivity, and positivity. Don't know about that. She coaches women CEOs, admirals and generals, college presidents and entrepreneurs on influence, impact and presentation skills. Her expertise is on women leaders and women in business. She is the founder of Power Women Worldwide. Her newest book is called Called to Lead, Success Strategies for Women. Avon and Real Leaders magazine called her called being one of the top leadership motivational speakers in the world. And today she's going to share advice about working with big audiences on big stages, how to keep the energy up, how to keep everyone engaged and how to use the stage. Everything you need to know about what it takes to make it work on the big stage. Please welcome Pagin Eshevaria. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. Good oh my gosh. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you, Pagin. So listen, before we start, let's just make sure that, you know, people realize you, you've actually done the big stages. What was the biggest audience for you so far? Well, that's, a, that's a super great question. The biggest audience was in a stadium uh, that I didn't at like one of these motivational rallies. And we had 65,000 individuals in the audience. So it, big. that was the biggest stage. It was also uh, when, when I began to really understand some of the tactics and tools that apply on a big stage that don't apply on smaller stages. And when I say smaller stages, they're not, not the same that if it's, I'm going to define a big audience as anything that's a thousand people and more. Yeah. Because the mindset, the thoughts are completely different. It was, it was so hard. Do you want to know the hardest thing about that doing that stadium? Of course I do. Okay, it was having your headset on and you would say, hello, 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 hello. How are you? 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 Because you think what I'm saying you can hear, but the people up there, it takes about two seconds to get them there. So I hadn't even thought about that. I hadn't even, yeah. said, you've got to change your pacing. Oh, you have to change your pacing. You have to do AV talk with, you really have to have some great conversations with the AV people. You have to be really aware of your presence. And I, and I know that we're going to talk in a few minutes, but one of the things that you all have to remember, you all have had training for two years to do big audiences because on the big stage and James, you probably know that, well, both of you know this is a lot of times you have multiple cameras watching you. So the experience that people are having are not you because they almost can't see you. You're so tiny. What they're watching is the cam, the, the TV. 
And now we all have such extreme experience by talking to that camera. And that's critically important. James, just, I'm sure you've got lots of questions. No, I mean, I, I just think I've just reminded. You know, um, it, there's an American speaker, Ron Kaufman. I remember him teaching me early on. When working on those kind of larger stages, you have, as you said, you might have five, six different cameras. And he said, have a conversation with AB. Find out who has that close-up shot, what camera that is, so where you're looking for that. When you're really wanting to land a very strong line, and you want to have that eye icon that's straight down the barrel of the of the camera, the, who's doing the wide shots, the, you know, the, on, the thing on stage. But something you, you said there, it, it kind of reminded me of a conversation I had years ago with um, a drummer called uh, Billy Cobham, who's the drummer with Miles Davis. Mm -hmm. And he said to me something, he said, he first started, and he, and he was like a really successful drummer. Um, and then he went and worked for Peter Gabriel, the musician from oh, uh, yeah. police. And they did the first night show and Billy thought he did a really good job. And he came off and said, I'm kind of happy about it. But then Peter took him aside and said, there's something you're going to have to learn. Because this was he was moving from doing like small club gigs, a like thousand, two thousand people, to now doing stadiums. And he said, all those lovely little minute things, all that real grace notes, all that lovely stuff that you're doing there, that's only transmitting to the first 10 rows. You've got to learn to transmit and connect with that person that's way over there. And so... He said his playing changed. He became much more physical in, in terms of dramatic, using his, his body more, using the stage more, uh, his uh, kind of um, the power. I mean, you talk about power a lot in, 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 your, in the work you do. It's, he felt like his, his physical power had to change. He's quite a powerful player, but had to change slightly to work. So what, what other little things do you notice going from, you know, from a terms of like presence, positioning, power, those kind of presentation skills, do you notice when you have to go to those larger stages from the smaller ones? Well, you know, I, so I'm, I love that you and I could talk about from a music perspective. And so I always think about it before I ever get there. And I have always created, because I, my intention has always been to do large, is that I do perceive it as a rock show. And so I do take, I break everything into five minute segments as though it's the playlist of a rock show. Mm. And what's critically important about that is you have to know that in a large audience, you have this kind of ripple that's going out, right? So you have to know that when a, a singer starts and he's singing a ballad, the reason that the lights go on and he strums slowly, and everybody goes into that ah oh, mode, and we he get, we get the lighters going at this point in the yeah, audience. Yeah, you know, it's it's preparing the audience. The audience knows something's going to happen, and they do it. The second thing is that he'll have his second song, which might be like hey, 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 and so you you'll see them start doing this and getting up and getting at educating the audience. I am requesting of you in that moment to lift your energy up. And so my playlist is an emotional playlist of not only what am I saying, what do I want the audience to think, do, and feel when I'm creating the playlist? And then how am I going to um, create that experience? So, but even before you step onto the stage, yeah. how creating that context, that, that framing, I know like with musicians, for example, they'll often have, a, they'll think a lot about the, the, playlist of the music being played before they even jump get on stage absolutely um, this is to talk about to us, us before that 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 preparation T take us through your life in that that first that 30 minutes before you step onto the stage so i'm going to give you so this is so i always fly in the day before i spend three hours before i ever go on stage to prep myself and here's a couple of things i do first is i stretch now People say, well, you're just going on stage. I see more people so stiff on stage because they didn't stretch. This is a championship. This is a, you are going into for the fight. You better stretch. So I need to make sure that my arms can go out really wide and I'm going to stretch, stretch. I need to know, and especially for women that are going on stage, they need to get those hips like anchored. So, oh man, oh, oh, just like, you know, let's look at J-Lo. Think about J-Lo or Lizzo would do. You got to get that going on before you ever get on stage. You have to absolutely positively. Here's one of the things that people forget about all the time. You got to do, I have to do this. 
I've got to warm up my facial muscles because it is critical on stage. The, and with that, I have to do my tongue. Because my facial expressions and everything have to be bigger than if we were in an intimate conversation, right? It's got to be bigger. It's got to show bigger. So I, I will stretch that out. As a woman, I will make sure, and men, please, men, oh, please, just hire a makeup artist because you think we see you, we don't. Every man should be carrying cherry chapstick with them. I can't you see. Know, so they lip. got me into the cherry chapstick, actually. I actually had my wife said, Why are you buying cherry chapstick? And it was you. <laughs> you have to have cherry chapstick because your lips, the lights, make you very yeah. pale. You have to, your mouth is your money. You've got to see it. So women should have more exaggerated makeup, more because you think, oh, I would never go out on the stage like that. Those stage lights make you really, really get washed out. You need great theatrical makeup to be able to not sweat through it. Be able to, and if you're a man and you're bald, you better have power on that because the audience is going to see the light shining. It's like you're walking around like a, like a light bulb. You think people are seeing, all we're seeing is your light on your head. Get that powder. So I do that beforehand. I make sure that I also, uh, I go to my AV. So this is really, this is the secret sauce. Okay. So I'm giving you some of the secrets. When I go to the AV tech, I always make little packets of candy for every tech person. I put them in the little bags and I go around and I say, thank you so much. Thank you so much for doing this because your work helps me. And I make sure they know certain things. I want to meet the videographers, the guys holding the cameras. I call them, they're usually guys. And I just say, you are, I'm Madonna. You are my boy toys. You <laughs> together, you are my Supremes. So I'm going to look at the camera and I do this all the time. I'll say, I'm looking at this camera, make sure I'm, they, we've had a pre check so that the camera will switch over here so that I can do this kind of talk. If you've watched some of the Avon things, you will see that a lot of times I'll go. And for you watching, cause we had 11,000 people watching virtually. So I need to address it to them. I need to speak to them that way. So I do talk to the AV people. If you have slides, I need to tell the AV slides only put the slides up for two minutes. I am the star, not my slides. So I might I even put black slides in between my slides to remind the AV people, black slide, you're talking to me. Focus on me. Don't focus on the slide. That's really important beforehand. The other piece, I don't know, James, I don't know if you do it, is I always use my own mic. And if you don't have your own mic, I suggest it. Yeah, I, 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 I used to do that a lot, but then... I found working in so many different regions, parts of the world, there's different AV frequencies that you have to do. And it just became so difficult. But what I do, and especially after post COVID is everything gets wiped down really clean before you have to. my head. And also I don't allow them to put it in my head because I'm just going to do that myself. And I know, I know how the way I was positioned. And then when it comes off of my head, I clean it down for them as well before I can I give do it the back. same thing, except what I bought was international. What, what mic are you using, Nadine? What is your mic? I use a Shure. Of course. But the, yeah. here's one of the things is, you're, you know how, this is, this is so there's two, here's how two women keynote speaking things that I want to let you know, and for them. So if you see your mic, your mic looks like that at the end. You always want a windsock on top of it. Windsocks can cost $35 a piece, right, to get a flesh tone. Well, I'm a woman. I go, see, this, you guys don't know this. Women know we could go to a drugstore and we could buy these eye makeup things. Yes. Oh, you use those? Very good. With these tips. These cost me $4 for all this package. And I try to buy colors because then my, my audience is amazed that I have colored tips that match the screen. I pull it off and I put this on my windscreen. I just now saved myself a lot of money and... Uh, by the way, I buy these and I give them to the tech people. They are thrilled because they never <laughs> things are always good. Things are always AV. Well, the best, the best <laughs> gigs to be a tech person at are Pagin's gigs. You get sweets, you get little little mic covers. It's just oh, wonderful. I, I give that all to them. I also make sure. So, so that's a before thing. And you said something really important. 
you know, for women, we wear earrings. And the reason that I want to do my mic, I like to bring my mic, is my mic is already customized to my ear, right? It 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 goes corkscrew, and I, I hired an AV guy to, 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 to mold it to my ear. So yeah. it goes inside my ear the way it is. The, I know it's in the place it goes click in my eardrum over here, and I can go for it. But I also have to be very conscious about my earrings because that can affect and my necklaces. So those are things that I really watch beforehand. I do bring a stylist. I have I hire a stylist for now every one of my gigs because I'm a show. I'm not just a speaker. I'm an experience. And if you don't know that about yourself, you think it's your words. It's the whole package. It's an experience. They're buying my power. They're buying my image they're buying all of that so that's why i started hiring a stylist so that every program that i do i'm wearing a customized look for that program let and me ask you a question on that Pagin, actually because so in the past i've worked with some big celebrity names and of course they actually put the stylist costs and the outfit costs onto the client are you able to do that too of course that's why i raised my fee they don't know that i'm doing it but hell no i'm not paying for that I'm not paying. So I'm not paying for two things. This is something really important. I'm not paying. So if I'm doing virtual, I'm not paying for the producer that suddenly I have to hire to do your keynote. Like you hire your producer for your event, but I'm going to hire my producer for my speech because they, so I hire Amy and I incorporate in my, my fee. We do, I, if it's a free recording, I put that cost to my client. I'm not paying for that. Hell, you're, you're saving money as it is. You're not, you know, it's not 20 people. So I always incorporate that. I do incorporate the fee of my stylist now. And because my stylist and I don't buy the clothing, here's what the gift is. People want me to wear my the clothing on stage. And they'll say, where did you get it? Oh, I got it from Dillard's and stuff. So the, the stores that my stylist knows is really happy. My glasses are all sponsored glasses. So, wow. It's a whole business, isn't it? Being on the big stages is brilliant. Love yeah, it. Yeah. Well, and, and you, you're investing in these pictures. So all the, my headshots that I just had done with all that are now being seen in this high end optometrist's office. My picture is all over the place as. But this is, so, this is, what you're talking about there, Piggy, I think is interesting because you were kind of early on on a lot of this stuff. Now we have this obviously influencer culture and influencers totally get this. Um, and I think I saw someone the other day, I think, a speaker influencer who actually has a sponsor for her dog's dog food. Um, yeah. like this, is, this is a thing because it's part of her brand of who she is and everything. So you, but you were quite early on this because I still think most speak, I have certain things sponsored. Uh, certain technical stuff sponsored, but uh, I don't have the clothes sponsored because um, I kind of get very kind of customized things, and it's just it's kind of my it's my vibe. And and if anyone wants to look like me, then they're insane. They shouldn't look want to look like me. But uh, I think it's really interesting that you're kind of going out and finding those brands that have a resonance with you. And oh, absolutely. Well, they find me more than I find them, um, and certainly the stylist is really helpful to have educated me. This is why brands want to be with celebrity stylists. They want you to be walking down the aisle. They want to see it on stage. They want to capture a picture. So one of my pictures, a boutique that she works with, got the picture blown up with the outfit that they had lent me because we don't buy it, right? With the outfit. And the outfit sold out because they saw me wearing their outfit. Like, how cool is that? You know, for James, for you, for instance, I would actually go to your tailor who would love any business wants to have business, right? And I would say, would you like to sponsor my outfit? I'll happily post the tailor experience. I'll happily take the pictures to promote you. I mean, that would be for him or her, whoever it is, a win for them. Yeah, I I was actually, I was at my tailor last week for my shirts in London last week. And, uh, and I think, you know, my shirts, because they're stage shirts, they're not just, you know, they're they're going to cost like $500 to $1,000 for, for a shirt. But it's interesting because when you have little conversations, it's quite a lot of musicians that go there. And we were having this conversation about Frank Sinatra. He used to buy his shirts from the same place, the same uh, maker. 
And he said, Frank always had a thing, which is, uh, I can't remember the name. I think it's called a corn, which is a, is a piece of, of material that goes from the back of the shirt ran to the front of the shirt. And it was first designed for people that do horse riding in order to stop the shirt rising up. But because mm -hmm. Frank always on stage, always used his body, like, you know, you know it, that was the thing. He didn't, he wanted to keep a very thin shape, but he didn't want his shirt to rise up and you get that horrible thing where the shirt kind of goes with the belt. It doesn't look very nice. So it's interesting when you talk with tailors or you talk with any kind of stylists, I, I just learned so many different things about, I think, oh, that's interesting. I didn't think about that, that before. So it, it, it's a... It's a bit of an education for me. So James, I'm just gonna let you know something. This is so funny to hear you. So women have known about bodysuits forever. See, we didn't know about this. So, what guys, what happened? This so is a thing. We know, this has been a thing forever. So you have the bodysuit and you put it in, it's like, you know, you put it underneath so that it doesn't pull up out of you. And so it's just so funny because I love you all very much. You're like, he designed this. Hell no. He saw his wife put on, a, a, you know, he saw his wife put it on and said, well, I should be doing that. The, and, and I'm really glad that you're saying this because I think one of the things that's important for people to know is where do you put your mic pack when you're speaking? Yeah. And you have to learn from superstars, right? Yeah. So I will, depending on the size of the stage, I might have a custom mic pack that matches the outfit put into my, the back of my shirt. Mm -hmm. um, I always, 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 always wear a bodysuit under because I know put the pack on my bra strap is the best place for me ever. And I just tell the guys, because there's always guys putting the mic pack, I go take off my shirt, I pull it up and they're like, you know, you don't have to, I said, trust me on something. Some there has been a lot of people that have seen my boobs. You're not the first one. Get over it. It's perfect. And I'm beautiful. So just and when you're doing that, can you also do a massage? <laughs> so, you know, I play with them on that so that they're comfortable, but I want it really sturdy. Yeah. And I want to make sure that it's going up the back. So that's what I those are the kinds of things I do before. But here's two pieces before that are critically important. That this is this is the most important thing that I think that a, a keynote speaker can do. You go to the uh, practice and what happens on you're on the stage and they're asking you to do a sound check. And most people do a sound check like this. They go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Well, that means your voice is not modulated and the AV team needs to know your modulation. So I have a song that I go, I put it on, okay, everybody, hip, hop, hip, it, hip, it, hip, hip, hop, it, don't stop a rock into the bam, bam, boogie. Now up to the boogie of the rhythm of boogie to beat. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. Now I know my ABCs won't you sing along with me. So I do that so they can capture how my voice is going to go up and that they're hearing the sounds of the the s -s words because they need to know how my spit is going out yeah. to modulate. And too many people just go checking one, two, three, check one, two, three. And that's an AV guy, but I am command of my keynote. So I need to make sure that they get my piece. So here's, here's a te technical question. And on that, on that, you know, when you're doing those AV checks, because something my wife, I learned from my wife is a jazz singer is when she goes up on stage to do her AV check, she sound, she checks her the monitors, the stage monitors, the audio monitors that we have on stage to hear ourselves, so we don't have to, so we not destroy our voice. She does gets them to sound check them first, and then she does front of house. But I speak to other speakers who they like to feel the out of house first, and then they will do any kind of stuff on stage. Do you, do you have a preference in terms of how you do it? I don't. I mean, one of the things is that I do trust. So when I'm talking to the AV people, it depends first, let's just be clear. It depends how, what the investment is in AV people that the speeches are that you're going to. Mm -hmm. If they are pure speaking AV people, like they've never done music, they've never done, they don't have any of that. Yeah. They don't, they have none of that. So if I go and prepared that they don't have that, you know, that's, 
I, I, I could think like of some rare places where maybe they've had musicians beforehand of me presenting. And so they have the added audio, they add a piece. I still want to get one of those ear heads things. They've, they've, they've right got those bass bins. They've got those great bass bins when you have a proper music set up. So when you hit that, those lower register of your voice, it really pushes through. Because I exactly. find a lot of corporate stuff, it's just all very toppy, very tinny. And, and it, it loses some of the power. I'm so glad that you said that. I'm so glad because when you're doing this stage, the worst thing, the, the one of the most uh, irritating things for audience members is high pitched voices. When you're doing stage work you, and you're doing your piece, I always tell people, especially women and men with high voices, to touch their their plate their their larynx here, and go hmm, <laughs> so that they're speaking in this lower place because the timber of your lower voice will actually resonate. And I've done enough study about this, but two very significant things. For women, women that have lower voices get paid more money, are more have more male audiences, are more uh, in, invited more often. It's, it's, the, have, it's, it's the Margaret Thatcher effect. She worked on dro yeah. dropping her voice. Absolutely. Any, the, you have to. And because here's the other thing. If you're doing this high, this cheerleader, one, it's really bad on your voice. Two is the audience can't hear you. They what they hear is you're screeching, mm. you're yelling at me. You're, you know, when and early on my husband would be in the audience, and we had he had signs made screech, screech. <laughs> so he would hold it up like behind the audience so that I would go oh because you get energetic you want to screech. No, I got to bring it down. So that's what I do beforehand. Oh, important. This is just so important. I have to say this. When you're on at this AV, there are three important things you have to do. First off, you have to be able to, I walk the audience and I sit in the chairs. I sit in different spots because I want to, I want to have the experience of what are they experiencing when they see me. So I'll, I'll sit at the mezzanines at the top in the back row in the front row. I'll sit on the front part. I'll sit in the back. I'll sit in the front, you know, because a lot of times I want to know what those monitors look like. I want to have the experience that they have. So that's really important. Number one. Number two is I want to be on the stage and I want to declare and I like to let the whole ABT know and the meeting plan know this. It is my ritual. I go, I am the commander of the ship. This is my house. This is my place. I protect my people. I am here to serve. I'm here to receive. I am here to give. This is my house. And I do this in the AV and I stretch my arms out. And I am absolutely in that moment sending out energy to every single piece of that room so that I create ownership of the room. It also makes all of the tech team really grateful that somebody is in command, right? So when I'm on stage on command, this is the, the other piece that I do, and I think it's critically important that everybody understands this. I learned this from Zig Ziglar. I had the chance to have a couple of conversations with him, is we, when we're on stage, should something happen, we are the commander. In social media now, you have to know, you know, stuff happens. When we're not in the, the you know, in the world, people do terrible things. How are you going to protect your audience? So when I'm on stage, I'm always look. I become an airline hostess. I want to know where the exits are. I want to know where the exits are behind me. I want to know where the exits are at the top. And I will do the practice in my mind. Which means because I want to be able to be prepared. If there's something should happen and everybody has to evacuate immediately. I, they will want to take me off stage to protect me. That's, but I'm the commander of the stage. So I have to be able to say, we're going to ask you to evacuate back rows to the back place, front, the front 20, here's your, here's the poles. If you're before the poles, you go to the back ed, entrance, use both aisles, move quickly, move quietly, help the elderly, pick them up. You are contained. You are protected. Everything is going fine. You just go and do what you need to do. I will stay here I, until you are all safe and sound outside. 
Pegeen, I have a question for you related to that. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that's never happened to you, but what's been the scariest moment you've ever had on stage? <laughs> so I've had two. Funny, they both happened with the military. So the first one was, oh my gosh, I was speaking to high command of the military army. We were in a hotel room. We had a hundred, uh, it was a hundred very, very old generals, big generals, right? In the room. And I was, it was a kind of a pitch fest about why I should be their keynote speaker at some of their big events. And in the middle of my program, a flock of birds hit the hotel generator and knocked out all the lights and all electricity. What now remember it's all about commanding. I mean, it went completely out. It went dark and I said, remain seated. I'm continuing. <laughs> and I continued to this day, those people that were in the audience don't remember that the lights went out. They wow. have they have no memory that the lights went out or that AV. They just knew what I was talking about. They remember it. That was really impactful. The second time was three or four years ago. I was speaking to a thousand military officers, generals and admirals and a bunch of people. And I was so excited. I'm on this big stage. I have somebody on and we're, we're doing this process. And I was so into it that we, we were doing that kind of this walking thing. Out of sight and out of mind, I'll make sure you remember my town. Or one, two, and they were doing this. What I didn't realize is as I was doing this march, I was moving to the edge of the stage and I fell. I, I just, I completely fell into the pit on the stage. Everybody in the front row heard crack, crack, crack. And like they were all stopped and nobody knows what to do. This is where commander is so important. I went, you, like, it was with the military. So it was great. I went, you go get the medic. You call the hospital. The three of you get a chair, put, put three chairs on the stage right now. The three of you lift me up, put me on the stage. The show is going on. And I went on stage with my sitting on the chair and I just went, I know you're all worried about me. Can you all just go one, two, three, ah, ready to go one, two, three. And they all went, ah, I said, good, we're done. Let's move on. And we did. I had broken my foot in 26 places. Wow. 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 So the, the Dave Grohl Foo Fighters of, of the, of the uh, speaking industry. Again. Oh my God. It was, so it took two years to rehab that. So then I was presenting in a wheelchair and a motorized scooter on Kino. Oh my gosh, I do have stories about that, but that's for another Again, day. Tell, tell me a little bit, can you give us advice? You know, people used to a small stage, suddenly they've got a big stage. What advice can you give with regards to sort of using the space? Do you just do what you did before and just stay still? I imagine you don't, right? No, 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 no. So I am trained in improvisational theater and children's theater. I've been in New York stages many years ago. I was a theater major. So I was used to some stages. And what I find is that people just don't understand how to use the stage. So I'm going to give you a couple of techniques for that are really important for how you use the stage when you're speaking. So the stage is broken into, I'm going to go easy way. You know, if, if I'm looking at you, so there's right stage, left stage, which they actually look at it from the audience, but I'm talking to you because you're the keynote speaker. And I know I don't want to confuse you. So each part of the stage represents something, an emotion, a process, a thought. So if you are on right stage, so you move over to right stage, when you're at right stage, you're kind of giving a synopsis of what you're going. This is where you're the storyteller. If you ever went, took your kids to, to children's theater, if you knew some, this is the point where they're going. And then they went into the forest and there she found blah, 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 blah. Let's learn more. So this is the part where you might be saying, today I'm going to be talking to you about purpose, passion, determination, and the skills that I have. And then you go to center stage. Center stage is when you're saying your truth or you're teaching a concept or you're, you're doing a, a point, not a story, but a point. When you're on stage, you want to be in the center stage so you have the center lights and you plant your play, your feet so that you are sharing your brilliance in that moment. 
When you go to the other side of the stage, which is my left, this is the time where you're going, the secret. This is where you're sharing your failures or you're, you're, having, you're breaking the veil of the stage to have an intimate conversation. So James, you know that time that we were both together and this happened to us? Well, I have to tell you, my head was bothering me big time. So notice my modulation changes. So you on a smaller stage, you know, literally just, you know, this is my keynote stage when I'm talking virtually, <laughs> right? So this is my keynote stage because I need to remember where I'm at, right? So if I'm going over here, the audience begins to recognize when you're going to be telling truth or the point when you're going to do a little bit of kind of background, what's the objective, where are you going? You might be setting up a story, then you're going to go tell your story, but then you're going to go over here and kind of do a little debrief. Let's have a conversation. Let's have a moment, you and I together. That's one thing that is very, very different. And because you have a big stage and you are not going to do this, just saying, you are not going to do this. The pacer. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the worst thing you could do is that and when I see myself doing that I cringe right it's say what you need to say and then move on say what you need to say and then move on say what you need to say then mine the other piece that you really have to do and you do this during AB is you could ask the tech people I for their tape I ask for markings I want to know where the lights are so that's something you don't do on a smaller stage. So I have to know when the lights are the brightest on me. I also have to know when I'm in my dark space. So if I go into my dark space, you'll see, you know, shadows. I need to know on the stage, where's my box? That's why in TEDx, they put the round circle so that, um. so that um, from an AV perspective, people stay on the round circle. I, I did. Actually, I, I, I saw a speaker the other day uh, who's just come new into speaking, and someone had said to him, "Listen, you're a bit of a pacer. You, know, you need to get own like just even for even small stages, own that part and have that comfort." And they they actually made him stand as, for the practice on a on a chair, so he couldn't pace <laughs> just to kind of get him comfortable in not pacing, and then start to then teach him like blocking and like understanding different state. But as you were saying, like different parts of the stages and how you use them. Yeah, it's really important, and it's important for you to understand where you are on the stage. Some of these stages are humongous, um, and you have to know why. And there's for I, we don't I don't think we have time, but I know we don't. Sadly, <laughs> there are six pieces of the stage that represent different emotions and different places. So that if I were in a big stage and really crafting something, I know how to go, but your lighting is critical and they won't tell you, they expect you as a keynote speaker to know where hotspots are. So I will carry with me sometimes tape if they don't have it, just so that I have markings. I need to know where. Um, the other thing on that stage, which I, we, you and I, James, were talking a little bit earlier is where are the cameras? Because everything is gonna be hybrid. It is, well, everything is hybrid, even if it looks like it's not, because on big stages, there might be six to 10 monitors, big monitors, so that you have thousands of people watching you. They're not watching you on stage. They're watching you on the monitor. So you really need to know to stop looking just at the front 10. You've got to stop looking. That the, the audience is more than that. So I was talking about other things that I do is I block out. I take the room and I make a quarter. If we have mezzanines up here, I do the mezzanine in half. I go around and walk around and I know that's one chair. That's chair. Here's one person I'm looking. This is another person. This is another person. This is another person. When you do quarters, the impression for the audience is, when I'm looking at that one chair in that one quarter, that whole area believes I'm talking just to them. It's the size of the stage, in the distance. You're if I'm with. speaking over there and I look up there, I'm choosing one chair and they do that. When I'm doing the AV, I ask which is the main AV camera that's going virtual. 
that's my other audience. So I don't look at the totality of I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you further down here. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. And I'm talking to you. So that really I'm speaking to seven people. Brilliant. Brilliant. Peggy, there's so much more you can share. It's so clear. Your expertise is brilliant. We've we've run out of time and I want to give James the opportunity to share all the excellent links that you've got for us um, and sum up, if you wouldn't mind, James. Yeah, so you, you've been sharing some wonderful gems with us today. Uh, you've kindly, um, we're going to have a link at the speakingbusiness.tv. We'll go there. Um, well, I think we're going to show it just now as well. But one of the things that you have available is something called the five stages. Uh, in order to kind of, we've been kind of talking about some of these about how to be a better presenter of your ideas, how to be a better speaker. Can you describe what, what the, the five stages are? And then we'll make sure we'll put a link to that as well. People can learn more. Sure. So a lot of people don't realize there are five stages of speaking. As you move through the speaking business, you start from wanting to just speak. What do you need to do that? What do you need to be seen as a speaker? Then the second stage is how are you starting to be seen as a professional? And I have very specific things. It's a checklist. It's an absolute checklist that you can use. And people use it for years and years and years to know where they are in their stage. And so the ultimate is the top, right? You're, 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 um, you've been a million dollar speaker. You've been running big, big, you've seen all this. Well, what else does that mean? What are you, are you looking for and having? So it's a checklist. So you know how to go through your speaking career. And it's, it's a fabulous piece if I do so say myself and Fine. it's, okay. it's yours. Um, yeah. So just do that. That'd be great. We're going to put a link to that. And you also have, um, we kind of haven't didn't really get a chance to touch on it so much on, on this interview, but you work with a lot of uh, women leaders, as I mentioned kind of earlier though, and you have these kind of two groupings, something called power women elite and power women pro. Can you just right. share a little bit about that? And we'll make sure that we, we link to those as well. Sure. So power women pro is for professional speakers, experts, and authorities who are paid to share their expertise. It's a free group where you're able to come in and lots of people post questions and ideas and thoughts. It is not a, I wish I could be a speaker group. We actually don't let you in. You are in if you've been paid to be an expert, paid to be a speaker, it is. And so we can talk about some of the, the nitty gritty details of being a woman professional speaker from bras to hairs to to negotiating to money to which, all those things. Which bureau is not to work with? Which are the ones that aren't paying on time? All those, some of those little things that we sometimes All those little well. things Between that us. drive me crazy, right? <laughs> and... And then elite is a one of my mastermind groups. Elite is for those those individuals who are ready. You know, they've been running their business, but maybe they're not making the money. Then they're not. Maybe they haven't hit six figures, or maybe they want to go to you know the two hundred fifty thousand dollar, and they need um, a champion to educate them. And I made this particular group specific because I was always searching for somebody to help me. I was wanted to like like. I just wanted to be around people that with someone that could share their wisdom that could not rob my bank and that could really make it valuable. So it's a very, it's a low cost, but you have weekly meetings. And then I have a whole platform with lessons and teachings that I have about that. And every once in a while I have events. So that's power women elite in the, the group. And for my men, I know, I know you want to be with me. I want to be with you too. So just email me at pegeen at pegeen.com. My men, I do do individual coaching for men and I have special rates for you because I love you too. I do love you. Just can't be in those groups. So I, I'm happy. I, most of my individual coaching happens to be guys who have watched what I've done from social media, from speaking, and they just want that help and, and support. So that's Fine. what I think. We'll put all those links there. If you go to speakingbusiness.t, you can also find these uh, links there as well. Pagin, a pleasure. As always, always learn lots having a conversation with you. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Don't go because there's one last tip that they must know. Okay. When it is time and you are finished, don't run off the stage. Oh, yes. You can bow. And here's what's really important. You put your arms out and you count one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, because it takes three seconds for the audience to feel you. And it takes three people to stand up to give you a standing ovation. 
Fantastic. Let's do that now. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Good. One Birmingham, two Birmingham, three Birmingham. Bye bye. Take care, everyone. See you later. <laughs>